Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. Our topic tonight is the light behind masonry. Now, we know that Christians obviously have churches and places to gather and meet, but does Satan's crowd? We believe he does. And Bill is going to tell you tonight that that place that they meet, one of the places that they meet many times is the Masonic Temple. You want to hear from somebody tonight that has earned the right, someone that has been there and been on the other side and experienced this? He didn't just get the information from reading books. He got this because he lived it. Listen to this. Author of seven books, Satanic and Voodoo High Priest, second degree member of the Church of Satan, a New Age guru, and the list is quite long, a cultist, channeler, Knight Templar, a member of the Illuminati, a 90th degree Mason, many of you don't even know you can go above 30th degree, 32nd degree, but he'll tell you you can. He taught astrology to row cards and astral projection. He's earned the right to talk on it. Will you help me welcome Bill Schneblin? Thank you. <clears throat> well, praise the Lord. It is great to be here tonight. Um, essentially, we're going to be trying to shed some light on something which is very uh, commonly understood in most communities. You will see the little the little temples, or in some cases, the not-so-little temples of masonry in most small towns and in all large cities of America. Uh, but yet, most people understand that this is a secret society. And, and what are they keeping secret? And is this something that Christians should be involved in? Well, we're going to try and explore some of that tonight and see if we can get to the bottom of some of these issues. Um, first of all, let me give you the classical definition of masonry, because the Masons, obviously, themselves do have a definition that they give the public for public consumption. And this is basically it. Masonry, we are told, is a system of morality, veil and allegory. Now, doesn't that help a whole lot? We can just all go home now, you know? <laughs> we all know everything we need to know about the Masons. Well, that's the way they would like it, unless, of course, you join. But actually, there's a lot more to it than that. Let me give you my definition. I define Masonry as the world's oldest secret fraternal organization, a system of three ritual initiations or degrees based on the medieval stonemasons' guilds, guarded by blood oaths and founded on the principles of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Uh, masonry symbolism is a blend of Old Testament symbols rooted in the building of King Solomon's temple and ancient mystery religions. Now, you heard in the introduction about all these different degrees and things that I have been through. But in reality, most Masons will tell you that in fact there is only classical Blue Lodge Masonry, that that is in fact the core of all Masonry. Now, Blue Lodge Masonry refers to the first foundational three degrees of Masonry, Entered Apprentice, Fellow Craft, and Master Mason. Now, indeed, Masonry has become universal. It's in virtually every country of the world, um, even now I believe in Russia. And just to illustrate this briefly, this is a, um, a stamp that, that someone just gave me from New Caledonia. I'm not entirely sure where New Caledonia is, but it's evidently somewhere where they speak French. And if you look up there, you'll see that it says the 125th <coughs> anniversary of the presence of Freemasonry in this country. And you'll notice many Masonic symbols on there. The one that I want to draw your attention to, though, here is the square and compasses of Masonry. And, uh, of course, inside of it, though, instead of the usual letter G that we're accustomed to, we have a bright red pentagram. That's going to be very important later. Now, what needs to be understood is that in the United States, all the Grand Lodges that function here come from the Grand Lodge of England originally. But yet, after the American Revolution, <coughs> it was determined that each state would have its own autonomous Grand Lodge. So every state is more or less its own jurisdiction. And so here, for example, you would have the Grand Lodge of Indiana. Now, um, the fundamental structure of Freemasonry is rather complex once you get past those first three degrees. You'll see here that you have 
two basic uh, stair steps once you get past the Blue Lodge, which is down here. This represents the three degrees I just showed you. Then beyond that, you have, this is the Scottish Rite here, and this is the York Rite over here. Those are the two major paths that the Mason can travel. There's, there are 29 degrees here, and there are nine degrees here. And then when you get to the top, you can go into what is called the 33rd degree if you're one of the lucky few that get to do that, and that is called uh, the uh, Grand Sovereign Inspector General degree. Additionally, Masonry has what are called auxiliary or adoptive bodies, and those are under the arch. The best known of those is the shrine. And then you also have things like the youth orders, De Molay and Rainbow, Tall Cedars of Lebanon, Daughters of the Nile, and so on. And now all of these together make up what is traditionally thought to be classical American masonry. Now, suppose you wanted to be a mason. This is something I'm not recommending, of course, but if you do, some of you may have seen the bumper stickers that say, to be one, ask one. The tradition is, is that you have to ask a mason. Masons do not do active recruiting. But yet, on the other hand, they are in today because, frankly, masonry is losing members fast. Now, I wish I could tell you this is because there was a mighty revival sweeping America and that Masons everywhere were just falling on their faces and repenting before God. And to a certain extent, that is happening, praise God. But I think it's more due to cable TV, uh, a little more mundane reason. Um, because, frankly, there are better things most people have to do today than sit in a lodge room somewhere. And unless there's some compelling either political or social or economic reason why you want to be a Mason, you're probably not going to bother with it because, quite frankly, a lot of it is rather boring. And um, so Masonry is dropping in membership. A recent Time Magazine article indicated that between the 1960s and the present day, Masonry has dropped from 4.5 million members down to 2.5 million members. Now, that's pretty catastrophic. It's almost a 50 per, yeah, 50 percent drop. But, you know, they're working now harder to get members. That's why now you will see more bumper stickers, more billboards, more ads in a newspaper, even though technically they're not supposed to solicit members. So you're supposed to ask a mason. Now, once you ask that mason, there's a process that you're supposed to go through. What will happen is that mason will go and present your petition to, a, to the lodge, and they will send out a committee. And that committee will, committee will meet with you and interview you. And there are certain requirements to be a Mason. And this might sound self-evident, but you're supposed to be a man. I mean, uh, you're, you can't be a woman. You can't be a madman, an old man in his dotage, a young man under age, or a fool. So if you're any of those things, I'm sorry you can't be a Mason. Additionally, you're supposed to uh, believe in some sort of God. And then finally, the other thing they require is that you would have to um, have the financial wherewithal to be able to go through the degrees and everything like that. In other words, if you were, say, at the poverty level or near that, they probably would not recommend that you join because, like when I went through the Blue Lodge, it cost me about $150 just for the degrees, and that was in 1975 dollars. So I don't know what it would be today, but I'm sure it's more. Now, once one other requirement I forgot to mention, you have to be a man freeborn of good report and well recommended. Now notice that freeborn part. That was used for a long time, over 150 years, to keep black men out of the lodge because it was presumed if you were an American black person, you were descended from slaves. And so really up until the late 1980s when the civil rights you know, legislation started really heating up, you, there were no black masons. They had their own separate but equal branch of masonry which was called Prince Hall Masonry. And Prince Hall Masonry, of course, was, was, it was sort of like the old Jim Crow days where they supposedly had separate but equal schools. And of course, the schools the black people went to were not as nice as the schools the white kids went to. Well, similarly, Prince Hall Masonry is much smaller. It's not as wealthy, but they do have all the degrees. Everything you see here up on this, on this board is part of also Prince Hall Masonry. And unfortunately, the same problems spiritually exist with Prince Hall Masonry that exists with regular Grand Lodge Masonry. Okay, so let's say you've entered into your committee and, and you've, you've, uh, you've had this committee report and they go back and they tell the lodge what they think. Then the whole lodge votes and they have a ballot box <coughs> with white squares 
and black balls. And if any of you ever wonder where the expression black ball come from, that is a Masonic term. Because if even one black ball ends up in the ballot box, you will not be allowed to join. Because they, they quote that one Bible verse where it says, Behold how good it is and how pleasant for brethren to dwell in unity. And they say if even one Mason doesn't like you or doesn't think you're a decent person, you will not be allowed to join that lodge. You could go and try another lodge, but you would not be allowed into that lodge if even one black ball was given. Now, I briefly want to tell you, having laid that groundwork, how my story is a Mason. Uh, if you want to hear all the rest of the bizarre details, some of which Stan alluded to, I'd suggest perhaps you might want to get the other video that's out, out there already called Exposing the Illuminati from Within, because I don't really have time to go into it tonight. But suffice it to say, I was deeply involved in the occult. Now, I came to Masonry a lot differently than most people did. I came to Masonry already understanding its dangers. And I thought it was a good thing because I was a pagan, I was a witch, I was a high priest and a druid. And the Grand Master Druid of North America told me that I should join the Masons. He himself was a 33rd degree Mason. Now how's that for an endorsement for the Lodge, huh? that it would be recommended by a druid? Uh, so anyhow, when I moved to Milwaukee with my wife and we were running covens all over the greater Milwaukee area, uh, it happened one of the young men we initiated into witchcraft his father was the junior warden of the lodge in the neighborhood. And uh, I thought, well, gee, this works out nice. So I asked him to introduce me to his dad, and his dad sponsored me into the lodge. And naturally, they were delighted to get members because, uh, like, for instance, that lodge, I think I was the youngest. I was, like, in my mid-20s, and I was the youngest member there by about 25 years. The average age, according to that Time article I mentioned earlier, the average age of a Mason right now in America is 70. And uh, in fact, later on after I joined the Lodge, typically we would have six or seven Masonic funerals a year, and we'd only initiate two or three people. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out if that goes on for very long, you aren't going to have any Lodge left. And indeed, that is the case. Many Lodges have had to close due to lack of membership. But anyhow, I joined the Lodge. I was um, initiated as an entered apprentice in 1975. I was uh, passed to the degree of fellow craft, I believe, that same year. And in 1976, I was raised to the sublime degree of a Master Mason. Soon after that, I went through the York Rite. I tried this branch first because people were telling me that that, in fact, was the Christian branch of Mason. And we'll look at that a little bit later. And then later on, I did the Shrine. I did uh, Scottish Rite. I became a 32nd degree Mason there. And then I also went through the shrine, I, and even I was even an associate patron in the Order of the Eastern Star, so I even was in that body as well. I was very involved in masonry. I was a real fanatic. I was probably in lodge meetings two or three nights a week. And uh, in fact, that's part of the reason we joined the Eastern Star together, is my wife said, at least that way I get to see you one night a week, because she joined as well, because that's the branch of masonry that is also open to women. So anyway, I was very, very active in all of this. And um, then what happened was I, um, I moved back from Milwaukee, which is where all this took place. Oh, by the way, I have to show you this. This is, this is me as a Shriner. That was taken about 1980. And um, soon after this, uh, my wife wanted to move back to Dubuque for reasons that are gone into in greater length in the other video from Milwaukee. And so we moved. And because of that, I moved into a different Grand Lodge jurisdiction. And uh, along the way, a lady who was the bank officer at a bank, I'd been sending checks to the Church of Satan over the years. And one of these checks came back to me, and she'd, been, she'd written on the check, I'll be praying for you in the name of Jesus. Because, see, uh, she figured anybody who was writing checks to the Church of Satan was probably in pretty deep spiritual doo-doo, amen? <laughs> uh, anyway... Um, so here I was, I was being prayed for, didn't really care, didn't really know. And along the way, what had happened was I, I decided I joined the Mormon church for, again, reasons that are a little too complicated to go into. And so by the time we got to Dubuque, I was a Mormon. And, um, and I was still a witch, which is not all incongruous if you really understand the nature of Mormonism. Anyway, um, so as a Mormon, I got this little ad in the newspaper for a prophecy seminar. And oddly enough, it was put on by the Seventh-day Adventists. 
It wasn't STEM. And uh, so what happened was I thought I'd go to that seminar and see if I could l draw some people into the Mormon church because after all, we had a living prophet. We had the full light of the gospel and all of that. Well, for the first time in my life, in that prophecy seminar, I was exposed to gospel-based preaching. And I had all these questions to ask this evangelist that was doing the thing, and he had a Bible answer just like that for every single one of them. There was no way that guy, I mean, he was filleting me with the sword of the Spirit, amen? <laughs> <laughs> and so finally, you know, I went home that night, and I was so scared, I couldn't believe it. Because he got it through to me that all I had to do was believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and be saved, Acts 16, 31. And I kept thinking, could it be that easy? Could it be that easy? And I fasted and I prayed, because see, in the Mormon church, if you're in a great, profound, spiritual dilemma, <laughs> you're supposed to fast and pray, which is not a bad advice in any event. And if supposedly, if you are being told things that are not true, the Holy Spirit is supposed to give you a stupor of mind and he will forget whatever you are supposed to do. And if it's true, then the Holy Spirit is supposed to give you a burning bosom. Okay, well, I didn't either get heartburn or get stupid. So I didn't know what to do. And so finally I figured I've tried everything else, and I literally almost had. And so I took off my holy Mormon underwear so there wouldn't be any static on the line. And I knelt at the foot of the bed, and I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. That was 1984. Now, about a week later, I was still going to the lodge through all of this because I, you know, my impression from being nine years in the lodge is that all these guys around me were all Protestants. And so I assumed they were all Christians. You know, they were Lutherans and Methodists and Baptists and all of that. And so I assumed they were all Christians. So I had gotten an invitation from this new lodge that I was about to join to go to a, what they call a high noon luncheon. And so I went to this luncheon. And as I, this is the first time I'd ever been in a Masonic Lodge since getting born again. And I walked into the building, and already it felt clammy and awful and evil. And I went down to the basin, which is where the luncheon was, and it got worse. And I felt more and more oppressed and heavier and heavier. And, and I felt the Holy Spirit speaking to me and saying, get out of here, get out of here. And I went through, and, and I, I tried to eat the lunch, but it was just like, you know, lead in my stomach. And finally, I got up even and didn't eat dessert. And you know I was serious if I skipped dessert, amen? <laughs> and, and so I got out into the sunshine again. It was like, ugh. I felt like I'd escaped from some profound spiritual trap. Well, later on, the Lord beginning to sh began to show me things about how this was really very dangerous spiritually. And I didn't have anybody tell me that masonry was a cult. Only the Holy Spirit told me. And the first thing he showed me was something which I want to share with you out of the Bible. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to go with me to Ezekiel chapter 8. And in Ezekiel chapter 8, now some of you may know Ezekiel was the prophet of the exile. And um, basically, he was taken away in the Babylonian captivity and did all of his prophetic ministry in Babylon. Now in Ezekiel 8, the Lord has taken him in vision back to Jerusalem to look at the temple. And starting in verse 12, this is God speaking to Ezekiel and says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord has forsaken the earth. He also said unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which is toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty and five men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord, and their faces towards the east. And they worshiped the Lord toward the east. Or they worshiped the sun, excuse me, towards the east. Now, that may not seem all that riveting to you, but if you knew anything at all about masonry, you would know that all Masonic temples are oriented, by the way, that's a Masonic term too, oriented towards the east. In other words, they, unless real estate or whatever prohibits, they essentially have a place so that the worshipful master and all devotions are offered facing east. 
Now, on the other hand, if you study Solomon's temple, which is what is being discussed there, you will see that the Solomon's temple faced west with its back, as it were, to the east. And here were elders of Israel turning their back on the Ark of the Covenant and facing to s s worship the rising sun in the east. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the temple of masonry is supposed to be Solomon's temple. And yet it's 180 degrees off. And not only that, there's, there's, a, there's implicit or explicit sun worship that is done in the Masonic Lodge because we are told when the worshipful master is sitting enthroned in the east, the ritual says, as the sun rises in the east to rule and govern the day, so rises the worshipful master in the east to rule and govern his lodge. Now think of that. That is absolutely contrary to what is done in the Bible in the temple of God. And the reason why God had his temple built that way is because all around Israel were pagan nations, amen? There were nations that worshipped various pagan gods, Chemosh and, and Baal and all of these other gods. And all of those were what are called solar phallic gods. They were rooted in the sun and in the worship of the male organ. And so God wanted to have something radically different. He wanted his people to have to turn their backs on the sun to worship him. And really, that's what God asks of all of us. He asks all of us to turn our backs on the old paganism that we used to be a part of, even if we were just regular old heathens, you know, even if you weren't part of some weird cult like I was. So what happens is, is that God oriented his temple the other way. And that, that really smote me in my heart when I read that passage. Now, let's talk about how masonry got, be, got started. <clears throat> its origins are basically shrouded in the mists of time. Masons claim that their first, their first mason was, in fact, Nimrod. Now, you know, if I was a mason, I would not brag about the first mason being Nimrod. Um, but, but as that most of us understand, he's the person that helped build the Tower of Babel, and it is from Nimrod that basically all false religion stems. Okay, then you'll notice... After that, we see the Egyptian mysteries of Isis and Osiris. And then we have King Solomon and the building of his temple. And there's a character in there that's going to be very important later called Hiram the widow's son. Then in Greece, we have the rites of Eleusis. Now that was the, the mystery religion, the predominant mystery religion in the days of Greece. And what a mystery religion is, is unlike your church, okay, your church... I'm sure anybody can walk in, right? You know, it's not like they have to have a secret handshake to get into your church, do they? If they do, you better talk to me after, okay? <laughs> uh, anyway, if, on the other hand, if you were in a mystery religion, that would only be open to initiates. The best-known modern example of a mystery religion other than masonry would be Temple Mormonism. Because while anybody can walk into a Mormon church... Nobody can walk into the depths of a Mormon temple unless they have a special card called a temple recommend. Okay, so that was a mystery religion. It involved a mystery, and you had to go through secret initiatic rites and ordeals in order to be a part of the rites of Eleusis. Then beyond that, there was a group called the Dionysian Artificers. Now, Artificer is just a fancy name for builders. And these folks were, were, were architects and masons who worshiped the god Dionysus, who is the Roman, or actually the Greek god of wine and orgies. Then we have the Kabbalah, which came around about the 5th century BC. It's Jewish mysticism. And then we have Gnosticism, which is Grecian mysticism. And all of these things all contributed to the, what today we have in modern day masonry. Then during the medieval period, we have a different group that came along around the year 1000 called the Hashishim. And this was a, a, the world's first real modern-day cult, uh, relatively speaking, and secret society. And I talk at great length about the Hashishim in my other video. I don't have time really to go into it now. Suffice it to say that the name is both where we get the word Hashish and also where we get the word for assassin. If you look carefully, you can see the word assassin in there. Uh, then after that, Along came the Knights Templar. Now, the Knights Templar were a Catholic order of knighthood. And they went over to the Holy Land, and, of course, the Hashishim were over there in the Middle East, and so they kind of swapped 
initiations and, and information and all that, and the Knights Templar brought them back to America. Uh, about the same time that that same information got into the Stonemasons Guild. And that's why today if you look at the great cathedrals of Europe, you will see that many of those cathedrals have pagan symbols on them, even though they were built by the Roman Catholic Church. And that's because the stonemasons who built those cathedrals were actually concealing Masonic mysteries in all of those gargoyles and caryatids and demons and unicorns and everything that you see all over those cathedrals. Then finally, we have the Brothers of the Rosy Cross, also known today as the Rosicrucians. They were the inheritors of the secrets of the rites of the Templars. And what's interesting is the first recorded printed use of the word Mason in the history of the English language involves the Rosicrucians. It's, it's from a poem called Muses Threnody, which is written by a guy named Anderson. And this is the passage. It says, For we be brethren of the rosy cross, and we have the Mason word and second sight. Okay, now, most of you probably know, but the word second sight refers to psychic ability, or ESP, or paranormal power. And the Mason word is the secret lost word of Masonry, which we'll talk a lot more about later. So right up front, we see the Masons from the very first are associated with occultism and with the Rosicrucians. And yes, by the way, I was a Rosicrucian. I got up to the ninth degree in the Rosicrucian order. Now let's go to the early modern period. This is... Um, what happened, a major watershed event occurred in European history that we call a Protestant Reformation, okay? And because of that Reformation and of the controversy over indulgences, cathedral building ground to a halt. And because of that, all of a sudden, all these stonemasons didn't have nearly as much work to do. It would be sort of like, say, if you had like a Boeing plant or a John Deere plant in your community, it would be shut down and everybody would be laid off, except this was all over Europe. Now, what were these guys going to do? Well, they got a big idea. Let's say we admit non-Masons to our guild as long as they're rich <laughs> and charge them big bucks, you know, to get into our fraternity. And so we had operative Masons who were genuine stonemasons, but they decided we're going to admit what they called speculative Masons who were just interested in philosophy and occultism and esotericism. And so that began in the 1600s. About 100 years later, we have an important event in Masonic history. On July 24th, 1717, which oddly enough is on the eve of a great high satanic holiday, <coughs> uh, they had a meeting in the Apple Tree Tavern of London, England. My, isn't that spiritual? And uh, in this tavern, all the lodges of England got together, and they decided to set up a Grand Lodge of England. And this became what is called the Mother Lodge of all other Masonic lodges. And except for some German lodges and some French lodges, uh, basically all lodges in the world extend from this Mother Lodge in England in 1717. And all the lodges in America, for the most part, are in fact descended from that Grand Lodge. Then uh, finally, we have another group coming along in 1776 called the Illuminati Ordinate, or the Order of the Illuminati in English. And this group was started for the express purpose of infiltrating masonry. And, and basically, because masons are always looking for light, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, uh, it fit very well to have this illuminous degree come in there. And before the end of the 1700s, it was very hard to tell where masonry ended and illuminism began. And notice that date, too. They started in 1776. That's going to be very important later. Okay, then we go into the more immediately modern period. In the early part of the 19th century, there was a fellow named Captain William Morgan, and he was a Mason, and he did something unprecedented in the history of Masonry. He published a book with all the secrets of Masonry in it. And guess what? He disappeared. Now, a few years later, he left behind a wife and children and a little bit of odd Mas uh, Masonic history, that widow of his went on to become one of the founder of the Mormon church, Joseph Smith's plural wives. Odd little thing. But anyway, eventually someone confessed on his deathbed, one of the two guys that murdered William Morgan. They said they had basically 
tied rocks around his feet, taken him out in the middle of, of a lake and dumped him overboard and drowned him. That caused such a stir that, believe it or not, for many, many years after that masonry was being driven from pillar to post, uh, Masonic lodges were closing all over the country. There was actually an anti-Masonic party formed. Like today, we might have the Libertarian Party or, or you know, whatever party uh, as a minor party. There was an anti-Masonic party, and their platform was get rid of Masonry, make it illegal. And this got worse and worse and worse for the Masons. And had not the issue of slavery begun to rise up in the South, and indeed in the North with the abolitionist movement, it might have well driven Masonry completely off the shores of America. But, of course, slavery was more important, and the Civil War came along. And after the Civil War, Masonry enjoyed a new surge in popularity due to Albert Pike. Now, Albert Pike was a guy we're going to speak more of later, but he basically caused Masonry to become popular again. And by the 20th century, Masonry was extremely popular, and virtually anybody who was anybody was, in fact, a Mason, unless they happen to be Catholics. Because, of course, down through the years, Catholics have always been forbidden to be Masons up until very recently. Okay, that brings us up to the present day. Now, before we go any further, there's a central thing in Masonry that you all have to understand or else you're going to get confused later, and that is the oaths. Masonry requires its people to swear oaths. Now, this is an old graphic from a monitor which is a ritual bo workbook of masonry from the 19th century. And this illustrates the entered apprentice oath. Now you'll see here, this is the worshipful master. And you can always tell the master of the lodge because he's the guy that gets to wear the hat, okay? Then you have over here, this is the senior deacon who kind of conducts the candidate around. And then you have the candidate. Now you'll notice he's kneeling at an altar. He's, this foot is barefoot. You can't tell, but the other foot has a little sandal on it. He's neither naked nor clothed, barefoot nor shod. He's hoodwinked, and he has a cable tow or rope around his neck. And he's been divested of all metal. And in this condition, he is led to the door of the lodge. Now, what's the problem with these oaths? Well, first of all, there's the whole thing of a pig in the poke. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard that expression, but basically a pig in the poke is when you're asked to buy something and you don't know what it is. Like, say, for example, if I came up to you and I said to you, okay, I got this great car, I want $15,000 for it, but it's locked in the garage and you can't see it. Give me your money. Give me the money and I'll give you the pink slip. Now, how many people would do that? I mean, not very many, you know, unless it was your dad or something that was going to sell you the car. I mean, you'd want to see the car. But yet in masonry, you are asked to swear an oath and you don't know what that oath is. Now, this master, he comes up to the guy and he says, you're going to swear an oath. It's my pleasant duty to inform you that there is absolutely nothing in this oath will, that will conflict with your duty to God, your country, your neighbor, or yourself. Having been said this, if you wish to proceed, say, I will, and repeat after me. Now, first of all, that's a bald-faced lie. There's a lot of stuff in that oath that conflicts with those things. But, of course, the guy doesn't know it. Now, on top of that, this guy is kneeling blindfolded. He doesn't know what's around him. For all he knows, there might be 25 wackos in black robes with daggers mm -hmm. went into pounce on him or something because the Masons try and scare the guy. I mean, think kind of like fraternities or initiation ceremonies, you know. They try to get the guy nervous and everything, so he doesn't really know what's going on. So basically, he says, okay, I'll go along with it. Uh, now, his hands are on the Bible here, you'll notice. They're resting on the Holy Bible square and compass. And in this position, he gets to take the oath. Now, these oaths are doozies, and I'm not going to bore you because the, the shortest oath takes about five minutes to recite. So instead, I'll just give you the best part, okay? These are some examples. Now, say, for example, you were taking the inner apprentice oath. The end of that oath, and I'm going to recite this word for word, you say, all this I most solemnly and sincerely promise and swear with a firm and steadfast purpose to keep and perform the same binding myself under no less a penalty than that of having my throat cut across, my tongue torn out by its roots and buried in the sands of the sea where the tide ebbs and flows twice in 24 hours, shall I ever knowingly violate my inner apprentice obligation, so help me God and keep me steadfast in a due performance of the same. Now, think of that. So help me God 
And then the, the worshipful master says, in token of your sincerity, kiss the book which is before you, which is the Holy Bible. You've, you've sworn an oath that you'll have your throat cut, your tongue torn out by its roots, and then you swe swear it by saying, so help me God, and you kiss the Bible. Now that would stand up in any court of law, wouldn't it? Then the second degree oath. You swear that you will have your heart plucked out of your body and placed on the highest pinnacle of the temple, there to be devoured by the, vi by the vultures of the air. Uh, that's usually fatal, wouldn't you say? <laughs> then you have the third degree. The third degree oath, you swear that you would have your body severed in twain, your bowels taken thence, and burned to ashes, the ashes scattered to the four winds of heaven, that no more remembrance should be had of so vile a wretch as I should be to have thus knowingly violated my master mason obligation, so help me God and keep me steadfast, blah, blah, blah. Again, very, very serious. Now, for example, here's an even better one. In the uh, degree, the seventh degree of the York Rite, you swear that you would have your, your skull, the top of your skull smote off and your brain exposed to the rays of the noonday sun. I tell people, this is your brain, this is your brain on masonry. <laughs> You know, so, I mean, these are nasty things. Now, can you imagine your pastor swearing these oaths? Can you imagine your husband swearing these oaths? Can you imagine your deacons swearing these oaths? But countless of them do every single day. This is very common in Christian churches. Okay. Now, then there's the function of the enlightenment. What happens here is you're supposed to be enlightened. And... Once you've said all this horrible, bloodthirsty oath, the master comes down and he says, my brother, in your current situation, what do you most desire? Okay, now, this is a true story, supposedly. Happened in the Grand Lodge in Milwaukee. There's, it, was, it was an initiation that was being taken, done in June. Very hot night. There's this really heavy set guy, just incredibly overweight. And by the time he, because you're about 15 minutes into the ceremony by then, and he was sweating and sweating and sweating and sweating, and his blue jammies that they put you in were just soaked with sweat. And he said, when the worship master comes down, he says, my brother, in your present position, what do you most desire? And now the deacon who's standing there, you saw that a moment ago, he's supposed to whisper in your ear, light. But he was kind of hot, and he was sort of, his mind was sort of wandering. And so the master says, what do you most desire? And the guy says, a beer. <laughs> and, and the deacon just freaks out, you know, and all the lodge goes, <gasps> you know, like sacrilege or something. And so the, the deacon bends down, and he whispers in the ear, no, light. And the guy says, I don't care, a light beer, a dark beer, just give me a beer. <laughs> so masons are looking for light, okay? And when you go through the second degree, you ask for more light. And when you go to the third degree, you ask for further light. So, so here you're going to get light, okay? So the master says to all the masons, he says, My brethren, stretch forth your hands and assist me in bringing our newfound brother to light. And then what happens is he says, he starts reading from Genesis. And he goes, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And he gets to the place where it says, and God said, let there be light. And everybody claps their hands, and the blindfold is taken off the guy's eyes, and what he sees, he sees the three great lights of masonry, the Holy Bible, square and compasses, illuminated by the three lesser lights, which are three burning tapers. And he's supposed to be enlightened by this awesome sight. Now, it wasn't real enlightening for me, but maybe I was a tough sell, I don't know. But anyway... That's what happens. That's how you get enlightened in masonry. Now, only once you've gone through this are all the dread secrets of masonry actually revealed. And you know what those dread secrets are? They're basically secret handshakes and passwords. So we're going to go into that now. By the time you're done, you're going to probably know more about masonry tonight than most masons know. In fact, I can guarantee that. Okay. When, you're, when your ritual training is done, you are taught that there are ways that you can recognize another mason. And those ways are basically signs, tokens, words, and points of your entrance. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, first of all, let's talk about signs. Signs are various weird cryptic gestures. The only one you're ever going to see out in public 
is the Brand Masonic Hailing Sign of Distress. But I'm just going to try and do a couple of the other ones just so you get the idea. All of the signs are based in the idea of the way your hands are placed when you take the oath. So for example, I'm going to right now do the entered apprentice sign. This is the due guard of the sign because one hand is under the Bible and one hand is over the Bible for the entered apprentice degree. This is the actual sign and you notice it reflects the penalty that your throat is being cut. Okay, now the master mason degree, this is the due guard and this is the sign because your body is severed in twain. Okay, now the, the grand Masonic hailing sign of distress is a little more complicated and I need to explain how this works. When you take your third degree oath, you promise that if you ever see a Mason giving the grand Masonic hailing sign of distress or the, hear the words that are part of that sign spoken, you must fly to the aid of that Mason if there is a greater likelihood of your saving his life than of you losing your own, okay? And this, is, this actually can be very serious sometimes because there are reported cases like, say, for instance, in World War I, a German U-boat commander has serviced and was about to fire upon a United States frigate. But he looked through the periscope and he saw the captain on deck giving the Grand Masonic hailing sign of distress and so he didn't fire upon the ship. There are many, many stories told, usually from World War II, of where American and German soldiers would be on a face down and they were both Masons and one or the other would give the Grand Masonic hailing sign of distress and they wouldn't shoot one another because they were brother Masons. And that brotherhood, notice this, transcends national loyalty. It transcends the oath you take as a soldier in the United States Army. Stuff like this. Kind of interesting. So anyhow, here's what happens with the Grand Masonic hailing sign of distress. You start out like this. Okay? Now let's say I was, walk I was a Mason and I was walking down a dark alley and I was being mugged by a crazed midget. Okay, now this is the sign that I would give. Now, handily enough, this looks just like what you would do if you were being held up, right? But actually, this is much older. I mean, this isn't just since the 19th century. You start out like this, and, and then gradually, you bring your hands down into this position. And then finally, your hands end up basically in the same gesture as you would be making if you were a doing the sign of a master mason. Now, but this all kind of flows together and I'm going to try and do it for you as well as I can. There are also words that go with this, okay? And here's how it goes. You go, O Lord, my God, is there no help for the widow's son? So, O Lord, my God, is there no help for the widow's son? And if you were a mason and you heard those words spoken like in a dark alley or when you were out walking at night or something, you would be obligated by an oath to go and help that guy. <clears throat> What's interesting, another little bit of, of Masonic history, is that Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon Church, was a Mason. And when he was being shot by a mob in Carthage Jail in Carthage, Illinois, he, he was at a window trying to kind of climb out of the jail because people were firing at him from within the jail and people were also firing at him from outside the jail. Supposedly, his last words were, my Lord and my God, according to the Mormon Church. But according to eyewitnesses, they were, my Lord, or, I'm sorry, oh Lord, my God, is there no help for the widow's son? And what's interesting even further is that a lot of people have speculated that many of the fingers that were on those triggers shooting Joseph Smith had Masonic rings on them because he had stolen the secrets of Masonry and run off and started his own Masonic temple, which is now called the Mormon Temple, because all the secrets that are inside the Mormon Temple are just you know, warmed over masonry. That's all it is. Okay, then next we'll go to tokens. And what do we mean by tokens? Well, these are the secret handshakes. And this is the way masons may know one another in the dark as well as the light. Now here's an example. This is the, the pass grip of an entered apprentice. And how you do it is you make a pressure on the first knuckle with your thumb. Then the grip of an entered apprentice, this is first degree, is to have a pressure in the hollow between the two knuckles. Then second degree is pressure on the second knuckle. 
The grip of second degree is the hollow of the second and third knuckle. The third degree pass grip is the third knuckle. Then we have this. This is the third degree grip, which is called the strong grip of the lion's paw or the grip of the lion of the tribe of Judah or a master mason grip. And here you'll see it's kind of like, you, almost like you go like Mr. Spock and you, you go like this. And that is the grip by which the Grand Master Hiram Abiff was raised from the dead. So this is the fundamental degree of a, ma the fundamental grip, excuse me, of a Master Mason. Now there are grips for every one of these degrees, but we aren't going to go into all of them because frankly I don't remember all of them and you'd probably be bored silly by the time I was done. But we are going to talk about some of the jewels that Master Masons wear by which they can recognize one another. This is probably the best known symbol of all masonry. And I'm sure all of you have seen this either on buildings or on bumper stickers or on lapels or whatever. Uh, this is the ultimate symbol of the Masonic Lodge, of the Blue Lodge. And you see there the square and the compass. This is the square, this is the compass, and then of course the letter G. Now if you ask the Mason, what does that mean? What's that G stand for? He might say, I can't tell you, it's a secret. Or if he's being very, very forthcoming, he might say, well, it stands for geometry. Or he might even say, it stands for God. However, if you read the books that are in the Mason's library, and every Mason has access to these books, you will find out that this G actually stands for the principle of generativity, which is just a big word for the power of human beings to reproduce themselves. And that makes sense. Because if you read in those same books, you'll discover that the square and compasses symbolize the male and female reproductive organs. So that's what this actually symbolizes. Isn't that spiritual? Now, I'm going to show you a very secret symbol in masonry that most of you, if you've seen it, you probably never knew what it meant. This will often be seen on like either cars or a lapel or a, uh, a tie tack or something like that. This is called the two-ball cane, okay? And it doesn't mean the guy's in the golf. I mean, I know some people look at that and go, oh, it's a golf club. But no, it's a two-ball cane. And it's a joke. It's a pun. Because the password of a master mason is Tubal Cain, who is a character out of Genesis 3. He's the first artificer in cunning metalwork, and he's considered to be the very first mason even before the flood. But let me show you a little trick here. Let's say, for example, you turn this upside down. It gives you a clue to the identity of the real god of masonry. Okay. Then another thing that's very common, I'm sure some of you have seen these, are the wearing of rings. Masons will often wear rings or other jewelry to let other masons know that they are in fact masons. There's not a lot more I can say about that, but those are some typical Masonic rings. Now this is a symbol which is out of the uh, York Rite fourth degree. Now, I apologize for how weird this symbol looks. I tried to take, you know, Stan was talking about how hard it is, you know, spiritual warfare, putting together one of these talks. I had to take five or six pictures of this to get one that looked this good. And it doesn't look good at all, I know, but I apologize for that. This is the sim sign of the Mark Master degree. And you'll notice, well, you won't notice because you can't see it, but around this circle here are letters, H-T-K-S-S-T-K-S. -S -S -S. And I get all these letters from people writing me and saying, what does this mean? What does this mean? Well, here's the big secret. This is the stamp of Hiram Abiff, okay, this circle that you see in the center of this, um, of this uh, odd-shaped thing. And it says, based those stand for, Hiram the widow's son sent to King Solomon. So that's what those words, those letters mean, those initials. Now you'll notice it has an odd shape. And that's because this is a stone which the builders rejected that becomes the headstone of the corner. Again, another place where they take the glory away from Jesus and apply it to Hiram Abiff. But what the story behind this is, is supposedly after Hiram Abiff was killed, and we'll get into why he was killed later, um, they found this stone laying in the rubble of the temple when it was about to be completed. And they looked at it and they said, this stone isn't true. By that they mean the angles are wrong, it's not right angles. And they said, this stone is worthless, and they threw it away. 
the stone which the builders rejected, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So later on, they finish the temple, and they're putting the arch up. And they look and they say, there's no stone to hold the arch together. And then they remember, ah, that stone. And so they go and they get it, and it becomes the headstone of the corner. And that's the whole point between the mark, behind the Mark Master degree. Okay. Now this is another part of the York Rite, which you'll see. This is the commandery, uh, the Knight Templar commandery. And you'll notice the motto there is in hoc signo vinces. That's Latin. It means in this sign, conquer. And basically the idea behind that is that supposedly Constantine, who was the first pope, he gets up there and he's fighting this battle at one point. He's not a Christian at this time. And he's losing the battle. He's the emperor of Rome. And supposedly this sign appears in the heavens of a cross. And underneath it are the words, in hoc signo vinces, and this sign conquer. And so he went and painted crosses on all of his soldiers' shields, and then they won the battle. And then Constantine supposedly converted to Christianity. Uh, there's a lot more to that, but basically if you study the, the archaeology behind this, you will find that the cross that was painted was not the cross of Christianity. It was an Egyptian cross or an Ankh. But that is the story behind that. Now this is supposedly the Christian degree of masonry. But as we'll find out later, it's about as Christian as nothing. Now this is the Scottish Rite symbol. This is a symbol of the 32nd degree of the Scottish Rite, which is the other branch of masonry. And you notice the motto there, Spes Mea in Deus Est. That means my hope is in God. And that sounds very pious, doesn't it? But you'll notice this strange eagle. He's got two heads. You don't know whether he's coming or going. And you'll notice this little top knot up here. Notice those little top knots on the two eagles. Those are going to be very important later, so don't forget those. Okay? Then another one we're going to look at. This is a symbol of the mystic shrine. And you'll notice here several important things. First of all, this is the scimitar or the distinctive sword of Islam. Now the scimitar is a very sharp blade that's basically used to behead infidels. You see, Muslims had a very unique way of soul winning. They'd come up to someone and they would say, I want you to become a Muslim. Will you submit to Allah? And if you said no, they'd cut your head off. They got a lot of converts that way. <laughs> Today, instead of using scimitars, they tend to blow people up a lot. But it's the same idea. It's called jihad holy war. And if you die in the service of Allah, you will go straight to paradise. Now the moon is because Allah is a moon god. How many of you knew that? Allah is not the supreme father god that we think he is. He is not the same as the god of the Bible, which everybody wants you to think. No, no, no. Allah is a rock. Allah is a rock and is a moon god. And of course, this is the star of the goddess. So you have the moon god and the star goddess. What could be simpler? Now, you'll see more, more quickly here, or more readily, the rest of the symbol on this one. This is the infamous fez, which is the sign of a, of a, uh, of a um, shriner. And you notice here, you can see a little better that this is actually a little Egyptian head, like of an Egyptian king, and that's supposed to be the pagan god Osiris. And of course, if you know your Bible, you'll understand how well God feels about the Egyptians. Egypt in, in the Bible, the Old Testament is a symbol of carnality and depravity. Now, this is a symbol of the Eastern Star. And you'll notice that it is above other things, and we're going to look at this a lot more closely later, but for now, I'll just point out that it looks very much like a pentagram, which is a symbol of witchcraft, and it's turned upside down, meaning the one point is pointed downward, and that is uniquely a symbol of Satanism. It's a symbol which is used to cause the kingdom of Satan to be manifest in this world today. Okay, we talked about signs, tokens, now we're going to talk about words. These are the secret passwords of the three first degrees. The password for the entered apprentice degree is Boaz, for second degree is Jacob, and for third degree is Tubal Cain. Now, we'll talk about the, the main word of the Masons later. But for now, what I want to go into is some other ways that Masons might identify each other. Let's say, for example, I heard 
that there was a mason running a store downtown. It was like, say, a jewelry store or something. And he gave discounts if he knew you were a brother mason. So I would walk in there, and I would say something like this. I'd talk to the manager, and I'd say, um, I see you're a traveling man. And he would say, yes, I travel from west to east and from east to west again. And you would say, in search of what? And he would say, in search of that which was lost. And then he would know that you were both masons, and you'd get the discount. Another way you might do that is to come into the store and say, I've heard that I can get a square deal here. Because, see, masons always deal with one another on the square. Another way is to come in and say, do you know the widow's son? Now, of course, if you say this to somebody who's, you know, not a mason, they just kind of look at you, okay, right, you know, why don't you go get a life, fella? Uh, and that's the end of it. But if he's a mason, he knows that you are a mason and you'll get whatever benefits you're looking for. And, and basically, that's how much business is done. In a, in a couple minutes, we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about how Masons often use Masonry to grease the wheels of business and the making of deals and things like that. Okay, we've just been talking about the signs, the tokens, the words, the points of our entrance. The last one is probably the hardest to understand just from the way the term is. But points of your entrance is the way that a Mason stands the way he approaches the altar in the east. And uh, if you look, what you see up on the screen right now is the way an entered apprentice would approach the east. He has the heel of his right foot into the hollow of his left at right angles to one another. And that is a sign of an entered apprentice. Now, understand something. If I were to stand in a courtroom before a judge who was a mason and put my feet in this way, he would know that I was at least an entered, apprentice ma an entered apprentice mason, and he would be required by his oath to give me pre preferential treatment over my adversary in the courtroom. Now, this is the way a master mason does the same thing. Now, here you'll notice the, the feet are at right angles to each other, the heels touching together, and this is the way a master mason would stand and approach the altar. And again, the same thing applies. If this person were to go into a court or even like a job interview, perhaps, and want to let people know that he was a Mason, he might stand this way and not have to say a word. It's interesting, though, that Proverbs chapter 6 and 12 says this, a naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Just what we're talking about here. And people say the Word of God isn't inspired. Okay. Now, let's talk about the good old boy network. Let's talk about the craft and business. Masonry has been around a long time, and it has been used as a way to get ahead in, mason, in, in business for a long time. Uh, masonry began with the Stonemason Guild, and it may surprise you to learn that it was just like, for example, the, uh, say, the Carpenters Union that we have today, or the Plumbers Union, or even the Stonemasons Union, except for one difference. Back in the Middle Ages, nobody could read. So, for example, if you showed up on a job site, and the foreman said, are you a master mason, and you whipped out your card and showed it to him, he couldn't read it. That's a problem. So how do you let someone know that you're a master mason if they can't read? Well, the answer is simple. You walk into the job site, you say, I'm a master mason. You can either use some of these little handshakes, or you can simply do this. You go like this, and like this, and the guy knows you're a master mason. And that's all there is to it. You got the job, just as good as he does card. Now, here's another question. It's more contemporary. Let's say your boss is a mason. Let's say that you're up for a promotion, and the guy that's competing with you for that promotion is a Freemason. Who do you think is going to get that job? I'll give you a clue. It ain't going to be you. Another thing that Masons do is they use the lodge to network. And this is especially the case with doctors and lawyers. Because doctors and lawyers, it used to be their codes of ethics would not allow them to advertise. I know all of you are probably sick of seeing commercials for lawyers now. But, you know, back 
in my day, when I was, say, maybe 20, 25 years old, lawyers were not allowed to advertise. And so the only way they could advertise was through the lodge or through similar fraternal organizations. They would develop networks, and that's how they would get referrals. So then we have the whole thing of discounts. I've already alluded to that, that, for example, you can um, walk into a store, and if you're a mason, you say certain little funny words, and they'll give you a discount. And then, of course, the question becomes, how many large corporations are being run today by Masons? Many, many of them. Just one example. How many of you know that Dave Thomas, the guy that owns Wendy's, he's a 33rd degree Mason? Might want to rethink where you buy your hamburgers. Uh, anyway, and it's a shame because I always kind of like that guy. <laughs> yeah. Then we've got the, uh, the lodge and the law. This is even getting more sinister here, folks. Um, because of what I just mentioned, this whole issue of how lawyers used to build clients, there's always been a close association between the lodge and the law. Large numbers of lawyers and judges are masons. In fact, in the old days, almost all masons were, almost all lawyers were masons. That's a little bit less true today, but and especially, obviously, if you're a female lawyer, you're not a mason. But many judges and many lawyers are Masons. Additionally, throughout Europe and America, a disproportionate number of law enforcement people are Masons. In London, it was essentially required that one be a Mason to advance in Scotland Yard of the Metropolitan Police. Untold hundreds of sheriffs in this country and police chiefs are Masons. J. Edgar Hoover, for example, was a 33rd degree Mason. This left a solid Masonic stamp on the FBI, which persists to this day. Now, all of this sounds only vaguely disturbing, but for one thing, and that is the content of the oaths that are given in Masonry. For example, when you take the third degree oath of a Master Mason, one of the codicils in that oath says that you will warn a brother Master Mason of approaching danger so that he can get out of the way. Now let's say you're in the prosecuting attorney's office, or let's say you're a police officer, and you learn that a brother master mason is gonna have a warrant served on him for his arrest. You're obligated by an oath to go and warn that mason so he can skip town before he's thrown in the clink. Another thing is, is that you will notice in the third degree oath that you swear that you will keep the secrets of a master mason inviolate within your heart, murder and treason accepted. That means any crime except murder and treason, you are obligated by that blood oath to cover. If he's a rapist, if he's a child molester, if he's a thief, if he's an arsonist, any of that stuff, you have to conceal that. You are not allowed to talk about that. And that's true even if you're an officer of the court. Now it gets even worse. Let's say you're a seventh degree Royal Arch Mason in New York right. Then the oath is that you have to keep the secrets of a royal arch companion inviolate within your heart, murder and treason not accepted. In other words, you've got to keep everything secret. That guy could be an axe murderer. He could be a traitor to the United States like the esteemed Mason Benjamin, uh, pardon me, Benedict Arnold was. And the Masons would not be able to reveal that. This is pretty serious stuff. Now, let me give you a couple of uh, examples of this. In many communities, especially in the South, try to bring a case against a Mason. You will not get very far, even in the so-called Bible Belt. True story, the boys and the juvenile court judge. There was a court, uh, juvenile court judge in the Pacific Northwest who had a predilection for little boys. And um, basically, he presided over a lot of these juvenile delinquent type hearings and many times, if he liked the boy, the boy would get off in exchange for meeting with the judge in chambers and exchanging certain favors, shall we say. Well, this fellow, the, the, they kept trying to bust him, and because he was surrounded by Masons, both in the courts and in the law enforcement, they would always cover up for him. Finally, one of the boys went and titled to the newspaper, and fortunately, the fellow who was the reporter was not a Mason. The story got out. The fellow apparently killed himself, but broken rocks were found in his pocket. Talk more about those broken rocks later. Another true story. There was a financial scam artist in London, 
And basically, he was bilking all sorts of people out of money. And uh, there was a Scotland Yard officer who was trying to nail this guy. And they couldn't get him, and they couldn't get him because the Masons in the yard and the Masons that were surrounding him were protecting him. Finally, the guy did manage to find enough evidence to convict the fellow, but guess what happened to the Scotland Yard official? He was almost busted the meter made. And he, they kept giving him the worst possible assignments, and finally the fellow actually had to resign. Then there's the case of the woman who was married to a Shriner. It was, her second it was his second marriage. He was considerably older than she. She was a young, attractive woman. And he was a member of a very elite shrine organization called the Jesters. Now, if you know anybody who's a Jester, be afraid. <laughs> These are very creepy people. And what would happen in this particular woman's case, and I know it's not isolated because of some of the documents I have seen, every Friday night they would have poker and he would tie his wife up on the bed and all the other jesters would rape her. And, and there was nothing she could do about it. She went to the local uh, police chief and he was a Shriner. She went to the district attorney and he was a Shriner. And finally, she was about to go higher than that and a psychiatrist came to her and said, if you say one more word, we're going to have you locked up as a paranoid delusional because I'm also a Mason. And you'll be locked up forever on my signature and you'll never get out. She ended up having to flee the state. These are examples of how Masons can cause a miscarriage of justice. But here is probably the most celebrated example of this in the history of the West. Jack the Ripper, a Freemason? The answer to that question is yes, one way or another. Let me explain. For those of you that may not know, Jack the Ripper is probably the, uh, the Western world's first known serial killer. He murdered eight prostitutes in Whitechapel District of London in the year 1888. And he had the whole city of London terrified. This was Victorian England, mind you. And nothing like this had ever happened in the history of England that anybody knew of. And here's what happened. They, they mounted a huge investigation. The man in charge of the investigation was Police Commissioner Warren, who was a Freemason. At that time, the Prime Minister of England, as is often the case, was a Freemason. The heir presumptive to the throne of England, the Duke of Clarence, was also a Mason. And the physician to the royal court at the time, Dr. Gull, was a Freemason. Now, here's what actually happened. The eight women who were killed, if you study this, and I happen to have been, before I even became a Mason, I was kind of a Jack the Ripper buff. I I'd read several of his bo the books about him and kind of studied up. And when I became a Mason, I realized that the way, the horrible way, these unfortunate women were murdered was in accord with Masonic ritual gestures. Just one of them had her throat cut from ear to ear, another one had her bowels ripped out of her body and thrown over her left shoulder, and so on and so on. These were Masonic ritual murders. But why? Well, here's what happened. Believe it or not, the Duke of Clarence, who was second in line to the throne of England, had fallen in love with a prostitute named Annie Crooks and he married this woman. Now that was bad enough, but he had a child by her, a little girl. And this woman, horror of horrors, was a Roman Catholic. Now if you understand the way the parliament and the monarchy work in England, there is a law that no, no member of the royal family can ever marry a Roman Catholic because of the adversarial relationship that existed for centuries between the Church of Rome and the Church of England. And so this was a great, this would have shaken the very foundations of the throne of England. So Dr. Gull, who was a physician and surgeon, had Annie Crooks committed to a mental institution where she died by suicide several months later, because of course in those days, um, uh, mental hospitals were not really club med, not that they are today either. Uh, the little girl, who was two or three at most, was placed in a Catholic orphanage. But every woman, in Whitechapel, from Catherine Beddoes to Mary Jane Kelly, that knew of the wedding and knew Annie Crooks were horribly murdered to conceal the secrets of a brother master mason. Now you'll notice the thing up there on the board it says the Jewes will not be blamed for nothing. Now you might wonder what the heck does that mean? Well this phrase was scrawled on an alley in Whitechapel during the height of the hysteria. 
What does that phrase mean? Well, believe it or not, Police Commissioner Warren ordered it immediately struck from the alley. It was taken off, the alley erased. He claimed it was because he did not want to have anti-Semitic riots because he was afraid people would believe the Jews were out there killing prostitutes. Actually, that was a lie. This term, Jewes, is actually a Masonic code word. It refers to the three ruffians who murdered Hiram Abiff, Jubilow, Jubala, and Jubalum. And this was, a, this was a kind of roundabout way of saying the Masons will not be blamed for nothing. Now, if you want any further proof of this, I would direct your attention to what Jack the Ripper originally called himself, because he wrote letters describing his atrocities. And obviously, whether it was Dr. Gull or whether it was an accomplice who worked with Dr. Gull, we don't know. But we do know this. Many people have remarked that the killings themselves were obviously done by someone who was a surgeon. The cuts were done very very carefully and with an extremely profound knowledge of human anatomy. Anyway, the first time, before Jack was called Saucy Jack or Jack the Ripper, the first nickname he gave himself was Leather Apron. Now every Mason, when they are made a Master Mason, is given a white lambskin or leather apron. That is the badge of a Mason. Now this illustrates how masonry can be used and is often used to conceal crimes, even for a century. Now, let's move on. We'll talk now about the craft and politics, everybody's favorite subject. Most politicians, as everybody has probably observed, tend to be lawyers. As we've already discussed, most lawyers are masons. Therefore, a lot of politicians are Masons. Many heads of state are Masons. At least 17 presidents of the United States have been Freemasons. Let's talk about the Revolutionary War period. I've already mentioned that Benjamin Franklin was a Mason. Pardon me, yeah, Franklin, Benedict Arnold, Paul Revere, George Washington, possibly Jefferson. We don't know that for sure. John Adams was a strong anti-Mason, though. Now, let me talk for a moment about Washington, though. The Masons make an incredible amount of hay out of the fact that Washington was a Mason. I mean, I'm sure some of you have even seen, like around the time of Washington's birthday, they have ads in the paper, you know, showing Washington presiding over the Grand Lodge and so on and so on. Let me tell you something. All of that is basically fiction. I document in my book, Masonry Beyond the Light, the fact that, yeah, Washington was a Mason. He joined when he was an officer in the British Army in his youth, dare I say, before he knew better. Additionally, in those days, if you wanted to get anywhere in the officer's corps of the British Army, you had to be a Mason. But I have a letter documented in my book that proves that at the end of his life, Washington wrote a clergyman and he said that he had not been inside of a Masonic Lodge for 30 years. So much for him being a devout Mason. I think he basically figured out early on that there was nothing that he needed to belong to and basically just walked away from it. There was no teaching in those days that you had to renounce Masonry or do anything like that, and so he just basically stopped going. And he made that very clear. Plus, on his deathbed, he denounced Masonry because he had discovered it had become a tool for bringing the Illuminati into America. How about 20th century politics? Look at all these darlings of the conservative right. Jesse Helms, Bob Dole, Strom Thurmond, Ronald Reagan, who was made an honorary Mason, Gerald Ford, Harry Truman, and Franklin D. Roosevelt. All of these people were high-level Masons, with the exception of Reagan, who was just made an honorary Mason. Now, think of that. All of these people, except Reagan, have taken Holy Communion out of a human skull, because that's what's involved in being a 33rd degree Mason. And you would not believe the oath that these people have to take. They swear that they will work for the destruction of law, religion, and government. And then you wonder why this is so bizarre today in our, our government, our political system. Freemasonry has been called America's civil religion. 
and rightly so. You will often find Masonic um, worshipful masters laying the cornerstones for civic buildings. I'm sure some of your civic buildings, like post offices or courthouses, have had blessings by Masonic worshipful masters. And of course, a blessing from a worshipful master is like a curse. Then we have the nation's capital. This is a map of the nation's capital. And you will notice, I'm going to spin this a little here. This here is the capital itself. You'll notice the little horned goat guy there around the capital. Then here is the square. Here is the compass. One point of it is over the Jefferson Memorial. And conveniently, the other point of it is over the White House. Now, this shows it a little bit more clearly. Actually, that may be reversed, but I'm not going to mess with it. Uh, you'll see here we have an inverted pentagram pointing straight at the White House. Ever wonder why our president is having all of these problems? Then down the road a piece, just 13 blocks away from the White House, is the House of the Temple, which is the supreme headquarters of the Scottish Rite. Ever wonder, number 13? Well, we're going to talk a little more about that later. So you see here that, that, and the Masons brag about this. There are articles in Masonic magazines about how a Mason laid out Washington, D.C. A Mason laid down the architecture and everything for Washington, D.C. Okay, now we're going to talk about Masonry and the New World Order. For as long as the conspiracy has existed, which is basically since the Tower of Babel, that was the world's first United Nations. How many of you realize that? Uh, the Masons have been working to basically accomplish two things. The destruction of the tr worship of the true and living God on the one hand, and secondly, the establishment of a one world government and a one world religion. And if you notice, you see that even right in the Tower of Babel. If you read that chapter, Genesis 11, it talks about, they say, let us build a tower and a city. The tower is a symbol of religious Babylon. The city is a symbol of political Babylon. And you put them together, and there's the new world order. Now, since that time, down through the centuries, masonry has worked either behind the scenes or even out in the open to try to destroy things for the church. Now, along, it, it started getting pretty obvious during the time of what is called, historically, the Enlightenment. Now, that was a period just after the Protestant Reformation in the early 17th century, or pardon me, 1700s, where this new philosophy came about called the Enlightenment. And it was the idea that we didn't need faith anymore. We didn't need religion anymore. We had a new God rising, and that God's name, science that science could give us the answers, that logic and reason could give us all the answers we needed. And we no longer needed to have all of these other things going on. We no longer needed to have faith in this invisible God that could not be put in a test tube, so to speak, and measured. And so the Enlightenment came along, and that was followed very quickly on by the Illuminati coming on the scene. Two of the earlier members of the Enlightenment, who were also Freemasons, were Francis Bacon and, Eli and Elias Ashmole. And what happened is Francis Bacon wrote a book called The New Atlantis. And that book was basically trying to evoke the spirit of the original continent of Atlantis. Now, some of you may know, some of you may not. Atlantis is a mythical continent that supposedly existed in the days several hundred years before Christ and uh, supposedly was a, like the golden age. I mean, it had great science, it had great philosophy, great occult powers, great technical achievements. And it was sunk under the sea because of its pride. Some people believe that that is a reflection of the Noahic flood in Greek myth. There may be other explanations. But what Francis Bacon wanted to do was create a new Atlantis on the American continent where masonry and occultism could be practiced openly. The most obvious, and what I tell people, quite frankly, is that masonry 
and Christianity have been struggling in this country for 200 plus years. It's kind of like Esau and Jacob in the womb fighting. And that conflict has never fully been resolved, even to this very day. And one of the earliest man manifestations of this conflict was in what I call Satan's seal of approval, the great seal of the United States. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on this, but let me just say this much. Down through the centuries, right from the year 1776, the United States began working on a seal. And this seal was usually worked on by committees that were composed predominantly of Masons. Now, down through the years, by the time we get up to this century, the seal was more or less obscure. But then Henry Wallace, Henry Morgenthau, and FDR, all Masons, decided they wanted to place this seal on the back of the dollar bill. And of course, that's where it remains to this day. So in 1935, we had the great seal placed on the back of our dollar bill. Scottish Rite magazine brags about the number of Masonic attributions that are on the great seal's obverse. Now, by obverse, I mean the front of the seal. And you'll see there, for example, all of the numbers 13. The num that's a Masonic number, by the way. The number is 32. And we're, we're going to actually get into this now. I'm going to put up a thing of the seal on the board. several interesting coincidences, if you believe in such things. For example, there are 32 feathers in this wing for the 32 degrees of the Scottish Rite. There are 33 feathers in this wing for the 33rd degree. Down below, there are nine feathers in the tail of the bird, contrary to what the Scottish Rite magazine, obviously in addition to being spiritually deceived, Masons can't count, there are nine feathers in this, in this tail which represents the nine degrees of the York Rite. What could be simpler? So, then look at that eagle. What's the deal with the eagle? Well, we know it's a noble bird, but how many of you realize that for years, when this, when this seal was first being uh, created, Benjamin Franklin, who was both an Illuminist and a Satan worshiper, sorry to tell you, and a Freemason, uh, he lobbied for it being a phoenix instead of an eagle. He wanted this bird to be a phoenix. Now, what the heck is a phoenix? Well, the phoenix is an occult mythological bird that goes back to ancient Egypt, and it was called the Bennu bird. And the way it, the way it what was distinctive about this bird is that every so often it would immolate itself. It would set itself on fire and be reduced to ashes. And then from the ashes it would spring, reborn, as a new, entirely new bird. And, of course, this was a symbol of death and resurrection, which is the core of the mysteries of masonry. Now, I want to show you something. Remember I taught, told you to pay attention to that top knot on the top of the eagles on the Scottish Rite symbol? Well, if you look at this very carefully on, on let me see, it would be your, it would be this bird here. This is the way Franklin wanted the eagle to look. Now, this is the way the eagle actually looks. You'll notice that this eagle has a little top knot that is not really characteristic of the normal bird. Now what I'm going to show you next is an Egyptian hieroglyph of the phoenix in human form. Notice what he's got on his head, a little top knot. This is again another indication of the occult level to which the seal sinks in terms of its symbolism. Now, let's talk about the reverse of the seal. First of all, if you look at the ranks of the pyramid on the seal, they relate to the satanic hierarchy. The unfinished pyramid in, in both architecture and in geometry is called a frustrum. And one side of that pyramid would be called a trapezoid. You'll notice there that this is a trapezoid, this shape, and it's unfinished. You'll notice also that there are 13 ranks here. And then look at the all-seeing eye up there at the top. That all-seeing eye is not God, brothers and sisters. 
Uh, Masons would like you to believe that it is. This is their God, but it ain't my God. I'm sorry. Uh, if you study that, that symbol, that eye is actually called an Uchut eye or a widget eye, and it's a symbol of the all-seeing eye of Osiris or Horus. See, my God is not a cyclops. He has two eyes, not just one eye. And um, now down at the bottom here, you'll notice this interesting Roman numeral. If you add that up in the Roman numeral system, it comes up to 1776, which seems appropriate. You'll notice that above it says, I know it shaped us, and then down below it says Novus Ordo Seclorum. That means this year begins the New World Order. Now, you might think, oh, that's okay, you know, that's America, right? We're the New World Order. No. America did not begin in 1776. Think about it. There were no, we hadn't even won the war yet. There were no Articles of Confederation. There was no Constitution. There were no states. This does not refer to America, my friends. On May 1st, 1776, the Illuminati was formed. That is the New World Order. Not America, I'm afraid. They just want to plant the New World Order here. But that is not the New World Order. Now I'm going to put up briefly, this is, this is how that pyramid can be decoded in terms of the satanic hierarchy. And you'll notice down here at the bottom are the conventional degrees of the York and Scottish Rite, all the way up to the Supreme Council of Grand Sovereign Inspectors General. Then above it, we have the various satanic orders, some of which, in fact, I'm sad to say, most of which I was a member of, all the way up to the nine unknown men, the seven, and then the great architect of the universe himself, Lucifer, the limitless light of nothingness. That's his title. And I think it's rather appropriate, actually. <laughs> anyway, and that is what that seal means. That is what that all-seeing eye refers to. That is a symbol, ultimately, of Lucifer. Now, let's talk about this conspiracy in a little more detail and depth. Basically, all of you, or at least I would think some of you, have heard of a document, an historical document called the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. Now, that was used, that document was used by a lot of people, including Hitler, to blame the Jews for virtually everything that was wrong in the conspiracy, that, that they were causing all of the troubles that were in the world. Unfortunately, they got the wrong elders and they got the wrong Zion. The actual thing that we're talking about here is the Priory of Zion. And notice how it's spelled up there. It's not spelled with a Z the way the Bible spells it, at least the way the King James Bible spells it. It's spelled with an S the way the Catholic Bible spells it. And that's for a reason. The Priory of Zion is a fairly secret until maybe the last 10 years or so, high-level Masonic Rosicrucian type body. And the Priory of Zion believes that it is the keeper of the Holy Grail. This group believes that it has the bloodline of Jesus Christ, that Jesus had children by Mary Magdalene, and that down through the centuries it has guarded that bloodline. And that many of the, like, for example, the Merovingian kings and some of the other kings down through the century, right up today, and of course you may know this, that Prince Charles and Queen Elizabeth claim to be descended all the way back to King David. They believe they have this royal bloodline. And this group is planning on trying to destroy biblical Christianity by the year 2000. And the way they're going to do it, see, they, they teach in their inner circles. And now this has all kind of been revealed by a series of books, beginning with the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail, back around 1986, 1987, that, that Jesus did not die on the cross that he was spirited away from the tomb, that he married Mary Magdalene, and they ran off and lived happily ever after and had children, and that he died a happy old age. And down through the years, these descendants of Mary Magdalene today are part of the reigning houses of Europe and the reigning houses of Freemasonry. And they, will, they believe they will very soon rule the world. But here's the interesting thing. 
the way they believe they're going to destroy Christianity forever is sometime in the next couple of years, this is the planning, and God can always interfere with these plans, is they're going to produce the bones of Jesus, or at least what they claim are the bones of Jesus. I don't know how they're going to prove that, and they believe that will destroy Christianity along with the revelation that Jesus was married and that he never rose from the dead. So this is part of the plan. And unfortunately, you know, they are moving ahead with their plan. I, I know God, though. I know he can certainly do something to prevent that. But ultimately, this is what's going to happen if they have their way. Now, if you want to understand the philosophy of this group and what they want to do, the highest levels of masonry, don't look at the American Revolution. Because while there were masons involved in it, it was very biblically based. Look at the French Revolution. The French Revolution was, in fact, a textbook case of what the Illuminists and the Masons would like to do if they get their hands on our government. Now, if you know anything at all about the French Revolution, you know it was, it was very awful. They had the Reign of Terror, where thousands and thousands of people were sent to Madame la Guillotine for a very close shave. And... Um, <laughs> clergy, whether Protestant or Catholic, were killed without mercy. Churches were destroyed. Monasteries were destroyed. Churches were defaced. Uh, for example, Notre Dame Cathedral, which is noted throughout the world for the beauty of its architecture, which is Masonic, by the way, was defaced. A half-naked prostitute was enthroned on the altar as the goddess of reason. And a crown was placed on her head and a burning torch was placed in her hand. This, my friends, is the, order of the, the, the origin of the Statue of Liberty. She is not the goddess of liberty. She is the goddess of reason, as opposed to religion. Because everybody knows that no reasonable person would believe in God. No reasonable person would believe in Jesus Christ rising from the dead. Now, would they? And so when you see Lady Liberty in New York Harbor, realizing that the light that she is raising is the light of Lucifer, not the light of liberty. And if you want further proof of this, let me point out two things. Number one, the Statue of Liberty was created by a Freemason in France, designed and built by a Freemason in France as a gift to the Freemasons of America. And not only that, if you look at the tablet that she holds in her hand, you know what's engraved on that tablet? Just four characters. 1776, the year the Illuminati was formed, not the year America was formed. Now, we need to get on here. The next character we're going to deal with, no, this is not Santa Claus on a bad hair day. <laughs> this is probably the most honored Mason in American history. His name is General Albert Pike. And this guy is one of two Masons who has the honor of being buried in the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C. You will have a lot of Masons try and tell you, because if you read Albert Pike's material, you will find out that he's an antichrist, that he's a Luciferian, that he mocks Christianity, that he denies the virgin birth, that he denies the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he calls the early Christian fathers dunces. This is all in Morals and Dogma, the book which is virtually the Bible of the Scottish Rite. But let me tell you, there is not a more honored Mason in American history. Albert Pike was a Confederate general who, by the way, was noted for his atrocities, both against Union troops and against Native Americans. He did things that were horrible to those people he captured. Basically, he, they called him a fiend. Then he went on to, with General Nathan Beth Bedford Forrest to found the Ku Klux Klan. And he had the title of the Chief Justice of the Invisible Empire. The Ku Klux Klan is a Masonic body. Now, it's not officially a Masonic body, but it was started by a Mason. And it, it, to this day, it maintains many of the same characteristics of masonry. Of masonry. He was the sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite, which meant he was the highest ranking Mason in America. He also was a supreme Luciferian pontiff, which meant he was the highest ranking Satanist in the world. He's also the author of Morals and Dogma. It was said of Albert Pike 
that he was the greatest Masonic philosopher of the Western and the English-speaking world, that he left Masonry, he found Masonry in a cabin, kind of in desolation after the anti-Masonic period of American history, and left it in a temple. He's the only Confederate general to be buried within the city limits of Washington, D.C., and he's the only Confederate general and KKK member to have a 50-foot statue in his honor within Washington, D.C. city limits. Now, why isn't the NAACP out picketing that, huh? Anyway, the guy was a racist. The guy was a war criminal. The guy was a Satan worshiper. And this is the most honored Mason in American history. Once Pike opened the door, a veritable stream of occultists began to get into Masonry. Arthur, Arthur Edward Waite, 33rd degree. He's the author of the monumental tome, which probably weighs 10 pounds, called uh, The New Encyclopedia of Masonry. He wrote many other books. He was a member of the Occult Society, the Order of the Golden Dawn. And in one of the books he wrote was the Book of Black Magic and Pacts, in which he's happy to tell you how to sell your soul to the devil. Thank you very much. This next gentleman, Bishop C.W. Leadbeater, was the uh, Archbishop of the Liberal Catholic Church, which is a branch of the Theosophical Society. Now, the Theosophical Society is the grandmother of all New Age movements. And he was also a pedophile who was nearly run out of England because he couldn't keep his hands out of his older boy's cassocks. Then we have Aleister Crowley, who probably doesn't need any introduction, but I'm going to say a couple of things about him anyway. Aleister Crowley bragged that he was the great beast, 666. When he was 18 years of old, he crucified a toad upside down after baptizing it as Jesus Christ. Uh, he basically was described by the world's press as the wickedest man alive. He bragged about doing 150 child sacrifices a year, and he was a bisexual and a devil worshiper. He was also, he had so many Masonic degrees that he said if he were to wear the jewelry of all the different Masonic degrees he was entitled to wear, an elephant would creak under their weight. And basically, I've seen a list of all the Masonic degrees he held, and it filled five pages. Then we have W. Wynn Westcott. He's the city coroner of London at that time. He was a high-level Mason and a high-level Rosicrucian and the co-founder of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Then we have Manley P. Hall. Manley P. Hall is more contemporary. He just died about, I think, 1991 or 1992. He has been described as the most honored Mason of the 20th century. Manley P. Hall was an occultist. He wrote hundreds of occult books. He was a Rosicrucian. He wrote the monumental masterwork, The Secret Teachings of All Ages and Countries, which is invariably in every Scottish Rite library that I've ever been in. And this guy, again, teaches people how to sell their souls to the devil. One of the books that Manley P. Hall wrote, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, tells us that once a master mason becomes the warrior on the block, the seething energies of Lucifer are his to command. When this fellow died, he was eulogized greatly, incredibly well, by the Scottish Rite Journal. And yet the guy was a black magician. Now, and understand something. If you're here tonight and you happen to be a Mason, these are your brothers. These are your brothers. And this is just a partial list. In my book, Masonry Beyond the Light, I document how virtually every leading occultist of the last century was a Freemason. Every leading witch, every leading black magician, every leading white light magician, they were all Masons. What a wonderful, wonderful recommendation for the fraternity. So, now we're going to look at Masonry from the Christian point of view. Is Masonry, in fact, a religion? I get brochures sent to me quite frequently by irate Masons. <laughs> I get a lot of email from irate Masons. Praise God. Pretty soon I'm going to get as much nasty email from the Masons as I do from the witches. Um, but anyway, and they send me these um, brochures in which they say Masonry is not a religion. Over and over again, every Grand Lodge in the, in the United States says Masonry is not a religion. 
They say it's a religious society, but it's not a religion. Now, what does that mean? That's like me saying, well, I'm Jewish, but I'm not a Jew. I mean, they're just playing word games. I say, let's forget the word games. Let's just look at what Webster's Dictionary said. When I first wrote my book, I went to my bookshelf. I had a copy of Webster's Dictionary. I pulled it off the shelf. I looked up the definition of religion. It basically said this, that religion, number one, is a belief in a deity or deities. Number two, it is an organized system of rituals and prayers offered to that deity. Number three, that it's an organized system of philosophy and ethics. Now, does masonry meet any of those criteria? Well, let's look. In order to be a mason, as I've already mentioned, you must believe in God in some form or other. Because right when they bring you to the, to the lodge, they bring you in, you're made to kneel, and you're asked, in whom do you put your trust? And if you don't say in God, you're let out of the lodge. They'll give you several chances. And by the way, you're not allowed to say, I put my trust in Jesus Christ, because the Masons don't believe Jesus Christ is God. Okay. It expresses that belief in conduct, ritual, and prayer. Obviously, Masonry is ritualized. It has huge rituals. It has prayers offered by a chaplain. It has a baptismal ceremony, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And it has funeral rites. If that doesn't make it a religion, I don't know what. Then it has a system of philosophy and ethics. You are told very clearly, right in the oaths, what makes a good Mason and what is not acceptable conduct for a Mason. You're told what is right and wrong. Not only that, but believe it or not, Masonry promises you salvation. Masonry makes it very clear in the third degree lecture that the all-seeing eye, we are told, awards a good Mason according to his works. And also, in the funeral rites of a Mason, you will find that they have the guy laying there in the coffin with his apron on and everything, and the worshipful master invites all of his brothers to come up and they place a sprig of acacia on the coffin and they say, we hold the memory of, the master, of this brother in our hearts and we commit his soul to the celestial lodge above. And that's heaven. And that's, those are just two examples. Masonry clearly teaches that you can be saved by being a good mason and that all good masons will go to heaven even though many of them may not know Jesus Christ. So, if Masonry is a religion, is it Christian? Now, mind you, if you're a heathen, if you're a pagan, you have every right to be a Mason because it's a pagan religion. But if you're a Christian, we need to ask this, is Masonry Christian? Well, Albert Mackey, 33rd degree, another very highly honored Mason from the 19th century, says Masonry is not Christian. I agree. It lacks the distinctive fundamentals of the Christian faith. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, Masonry does not confess Jesus Christ as God. The Blue Lodge never will say that Jesus Christ is God. In one degree, and we'll deal with that in a little bit, Masons do talk about the, um, the, the fact that Jesus Christ is God, and that's the Knights Templar degree. But many Masons never go through that degree. Additionally, it teaches another gospel of salvation by good works. Third, it denies that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. For example, if you were to go to the Scottish Rite Cathedral on Holy Thursday, that's the day before Good Friday for those of you that weren't raised Catholic, <laughs> Holy Thursday, and um, you'll see the, pe the feast excuse me, of the Paschal Lamb. This is a beautiful feast that's open to the public in most Grand Lodge jurisdictions. And they have this huge table covered by a rose-colored cloth that's in the shape of a Calvary cross, and all these guys come out in, in rose-colored vestments. They all look like remarkably like Catholic priests. And they do this very elaborate ritual about the Last Supper. And part of what is said in that ritual is, whether or not Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead, we cannot say. Well, I can say. Jesus Christ did rise from the dead, and right now he's reigning in glory, and he's reigning in my heart. Additionally, it will not teach, and it does not teach, that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Now, the Mason might say, hold on a minute, hold on. We have this Bible open on all of our lodge altars. 
This Bible is open on every lodge, and we're told it's the rule and guide of our faith. That may be true if you're in America. But if you're in Pakistan, you're going to have the Quran open on your altar. If you're in India, you're going to have the Rig Veda or the Bhagavad Gita open on your altar. If you're in Utah, you'll have the Book of Mormon open on your altar. And I really believe if you're in San Francisco, you'll probably have the uh, Satanic Bible open on your altar. No, I'm kidding. But the point is, the Bible isn't really the Word of God to a Mason. In Masonic jurisprudence and Masonic polity, the Bible is a symbol of whatever the Mason happens to believe in. That's all it is. They deny that it is the errant word of God. Finally, the Bible teaches, or pardon me, Masonry teaches that all religions are equally good. Masonry says that the, the Buddhist, the Mongol, the Din, the uh, Hindu, all may gather around Masonry's hospitable altar and pray to the one and true God. Now, how on earth are they going to do that? I mean, think about it. Okay, we're going to get into individual issues now with the different bodies. The Blue Lodge is what we're going to spend the most time on. Because, quite frankly, that's where I think 60% of Masons never get past the Blue Lodge. First of all, people ask me all the time, well, how far do you have to get into Masonry before you discover it's anti-Christian? I tell them about 10 minutes. <laughs> and I'll tell you why, because here's what happens. You're brought into the Lodge, you make, you, they take you to this little ante room, and you take off all your clothes except your undies, and they put these blue jammies on you. And you're hoodwinked, which is true in more ways than one, and you've got a rope around your neck, which is called a take cable toe, and you're led to the door of the Lodge after making sure you have no metal on your body. You even have to remove your wedding ring, your wedding ring. Now, do you think your wife would like that? Anyhow, here's how it goes. You knock on the door of the lodge three times. Someone comes and says, who comes here? Now, there's a guy who's guiding you, and he's got you by the hand, and he says, Mr. Bill Snevelin, who has long been in darkness and now seeks to be brought to light, to receive a part in the rights and benefits of this worshipful lodge erected to God and dedicated to the Holy Saints John, as all brothers and fellows have done before him. Now, Imagine your pastor or your deacon in your church saying, I have long been in darkness and now seek to be brought to light. Hold it a minute. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Amen? Amen. Jesus Christ is the true source of all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, according to Colossians 2. With those two biblical truths in mind, what could possibly masonry have to add if you're already a Christian? You have Jesus Christ dwelling in your heart. What further light can masonry bring, you, masonry bring you? Essentially, if passively, you have denied Christ. Then you come into the lodge, and you're made to go around, they, they waltz you around in a circumambulation, and you go and you approach the altar, and you kneel and you take this oath. Here we run into another problem. The oaths. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 5, 34, 37, that we should never swear oaths. And that command is repeated in James 5.12. My brothers, above all things, swear no oaths. Don't swear by heaven or by earth, but yet your yea be yea and your nay be nay, for anything else cometh from the evil one. So we know where those oaths come from. They come from the evil one. And now a mason might say, oh, well, those oaths are just symbolic. They aren't real. I mean, nobody really gets killed. Nobody really has their throat cut or anything. Well, maybe, maybe not. But if those oaths are symbolic, guess what? You're breaking the second commandment. You're taking the name of the Lord in vain because you swore on a Bible and you said, so help me God. So you just took the name of the Lord in vain because you swore a frivolous oath. Not only that, you swore an oath that you would... Now, your body, if you're a Christian, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you swore that you would have your body cut up and your throat cut and mutilated and all this stuff, that's, that's all murder. You're swearing that you will allow murder to be committed to yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, if that oath isn't for real, well, okay, that gets rid of that, but then you've taken the name of the Lord in vain. So no matter which way the mason goes on these oaths, he bumps into one of the commandments of God. Then, how about being yoked to countless unbelievers? It says in 2 Corinthians 6, 
Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. What fellowship hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. We've already demonstrated that masonry is full of unclean things. All of the, the squares, the compasses, most of the symbols of masonry are, are idolatrous. And on top of that, look at all the Hindus that are masons. Look at all the Muslims that are masons. Sure, maybe every guy in your lodge is a Christian, maybe. But you're equally yoked to all those other people all over the world, including a lot of witches. I personally, when I was a mason, knew more than a dozen witches and Satanists that were also masons. And they're your brothers, too. You're yoked to them. And you might say, well, wait a minute, that scripture applies to marriage. I'm not married to these guys. You want to bet? When you are kneeling at that altar as an entered apprentice, and you've just taken the oath, and you've had your blindfold removed, the master comes to you and he says, Brother Senior Deacon, remove that cable toe from about our brother's neck. That's the rope. Because he is now bound by a much stronger tie to our fraternity. There is a spiritual bond that takes place at that moment. You're in bondage to the lodge. From that time on, you're linked to all of those people. Then, of course, we finally have the character we've all been waiting to hear so much about, Hiram Abiff the Christ of Masonry. Now you might say, well, what does that mean? I never heard that, if you're a Mason. I never heard about that. Well, the most official thing that any Mason can hold in his hand as far as official Masonic um, literature is the Monitor, the Ritual Workbook. And the Monitor of the State of Tennessee in 1946 had this statement in it. Hindus have Vishnu and Krishna. The Jews have Moses. The Christians have Christ. And the Masons have Hiram. Hiram is the Messiah of the Masonic Lodge. And I'm going to prove that in very short order. Now, I need to explain something, though, first, because those of you that aren't Masons are wondering, well, who the heck is this guy? Well, Hiram is a very minor character in the Bible. He's mentioned maybe two or three times. He's a craftsman who comes from Tyre He's the son of a widow. And he basically works to make the molten sea and the brazen pillars for King Solomon. That's all the Bible says about him, except for one other thing. The Bible says that Hiram finished all the work that Solomon gave him to do, which is a direct contradiction of what the Masonic ritual says. Now, the core of Masonic ritual in the Blue Lodge is what is called the Hiramic legend, the legend of Hiram. And this forms the main body of what a, what, a, what a master mason candidate goes through. After he's done the oath, after he's, you know, had the usual stuff done to him, he's made to go through a ritual ordeal acting as Hiram Abiff. They blindfold him and they tell him that he's going to take the part, now listen to this, of the greatest mason if not the greatest man who ever lived. Now, I'm sorry, this guy is just a footnote in the Bible. And, you know, Jesus Christ is greater than he is for sure. Moses is greater for sure. David is greater. David is a man after God's own heart. Abraham. I mean, for all we know, this Hiram wasn't even a, he wasn't even a Jew. He wasn't even one of God's chosen people. But yet he's the greatest mason, if not the greatest man who ever lived. So you're blindfolded, and you're being made to act the part of Hiram in a ritual drama. And you're led around the lodge by a conductor, and you're stopped, and you're accosted by a ruffian, Jew below. Remember the three Jew A's? Here's where they come into play. He grabs the guy by the lapel, as rough as possible, and he says, give me the secrets of a master mason. And Hiram says, I cannot. The idea is here that the temple is nearly done. These guys are fellow craft. And they've been promised that when the temple is done, they will receive the secrets of a master mason so they can go and travel in the foreign countries and work and receive master's wages. So they are trying to get these from Hiram. And he says, this is the most improper way to ask for these secrets. They can only be given in the presence of three. Solomon, king of Israel, Hiram, king of Tyre, and myself. And the guy says, give me a sec the secrets of a master mason or I'll take your life. 
And Hiram says, I cannot, I will not. And then he strikes him, but Hiram manages to escape. And he's dragged further around the lodge to the, the senior warden station where he's stopped again. And the guy goes through the same thing with him a second time. And then he's, he manages to escape him, and he's dragged further, and ultimately he's stopped by Jubilum. And Jubilum asks him for the secrets of a master mason, and he says, I cannot, I will not, and he says, then die. And they smack the candidate on the head with a setting ball. It's made out of rubber. And they've got some guys behind him that are holding this kind of trampoline-like thing. And they knock him head over heels into this trampoline, and he's, be, he's supposed to be dead. Then they go around the lodge and they bury him because they're trying to conceal the fact that they just murdered the Grand Master. So they bury him in the rubble of the temple. And what that means practically is that they take him to a corner of the lodge and they dump a bunch of kindling wood on him. And then in, at midnight, they come in and they dig up the body, they tear it, carry it out of Jerusalem and they bury it on a hill <coughs> where there's an acacia bush, which is the Masonic symbol of immortality. Well, anyhow, to make a long, this stuff takes about an hour to do, to make a long story short, the ruffians are exposed, and they find out that this Grand Master Hiram is buried up on this hillside. So Solomon goes up there with these fellow craft and with his colleague Hiram, King of Tyre. Not the same Hiram, this is a king. And they go up there, and Solomon says, My brother, I feared the Master's word is forever lost. Why? Well, because... One third of it was held by Solomon, one third by Hiram, king of Tyre, and one third by Hiram of Biff, and now Hiram of Biff is history. He's maggot meat. So what are we going to do? So they decide on the way to the grave that whatever words are first spoken upon seeing the body, those will be the substitute word. Okay? So they get to the body, and as they get to the body, they're all going like this because it stinks so bad. They can't smell it because, as the ritual says, because of the effluvia which emanated from the grave. And this is partly where you get the Master Mason sign is this, okay? So they, they, he, Solomon says, okay, let's try and raise the body with the grip of an entered apprentice. So they try to do that, but unfortunately the flesh cleaves from the bones and they can't raise the body. So, okay, let's try fellow craft grip. So they use the fellow craft grip, and again, the flesh falls off the bones, and they can't move the body because the body is so corrupt. So Solomon says, brothers, let's pray. And so they say a prayer, and he says, I will now endeavor to raise the body by the strong grip of the lion's paw, the master mason grip. So he brings the guy up. Now, this is the candidate. He's been laying there all this time. They raise him up from the grave and pull him into the five points of fellowship, which is basically foot to foot, knee to knee, breast to breast, hand to back, and mouth to ear. And then he whispers the secret new word of the master mason in the guy's ear. And that secret word is Mahabon. Are you all just awestruck with the wonderfulness and beauty of it? The translation will astonish you even more. You know what that means in Hebrew? Most Masons don't even know what the word means. It means in Hebrew, roughly, what? The builder? Because that's what they said when they got to the grave. They go, what? The builder? Because Hiram was the builder, you know. So that's the great secret of the Master Mason degree. The real word is lost. Now let me explain something about this. When you go down and you're knocked down as a candidate, pretending to be Hiram, that's a Masonic baptism. It's even called that in the literature. Just like when you are baptized in water as a Christian, you die in Christ and then what? You're raised in Christ out of the water. Well, there's no water here, but you die in Hiram and then you're raised in Hiram. It's the same exact thing. Except, do you really want to be raised in Hiram? You won't after you see this next slide. Who is Hiram, really? Well, Hiram is just a front for the slain and risen god of all the different pagan mythologies. And the Masons will tell you this if you read their books. Let's take the most famous slain and risen god of all, Osiris, the god of the dead in ancient Egypt. Okay. Hiram is a widow's son. So is Os Os Osiris. His mother is also his lover, Isis. Just like Nimrod. Nimrod also 
is a slain and risen God who married his own mother. Isn't that spiritual, though? Anyway, Hiram is slain by a ruffian. Osiris is killed by his brother Set. Hiram is buried three times, once in the rubble of the temple, once on the hillside underneath the acacia tree, and finally in a splendiferous monument that we'll talk about in a minute. Osiris is also buried three times. Hiram travels as a son. What does that mean? Well, when he's led around the lodge and is attacked by the three ruffians, he's moving clockwise, which is the direction of the sun. Also, Osiris. Hiram is raised from the dead, but with something missing. That something is the lost word. Hiram, uh, pardon me, Osiris is raised from the dead, but with something missing. Now, we're going to have to talk about that. According to Egyptian legend, when Set murdered Hiram, he was essentially cut into 12 pieces. Now, Isis was a goddess, and she wept and moaned over the fact that her, her lover was gone, and she ran over the countryside to find all the different pieces. And when she found them, she put them all together and used her magic to bring him back to life. But unfortunately, one piece was missing. Guess which piece? A very important one if you're a guy. <clears throat> anyway, that piece was missing. And so Osiris could not be fully restored. And so instead of living, he had to go to the realms of the dead and reign over the underworld. Now, we've already mentioned what Osiris's lost member was. What about this? Let's look at the monument. I tried to get a picture of this, but I couldn't find one of the monument that is erected over... Hiram's dead body when he was finally buried with honor. And what it is, it's a picture of a broken column with a beautiful virgin weeping over that broken column and behind the virgin is Father Time unbraiding her hair. Okay? Now let me decode that for you. The broken column is the missing member. That's pretty easy. The beautiful virgin is Isis who is both virgin and mother. And finally, Father Time. You know what Father Time was known as in Greek mythology? He was called Kronos. That's where we get our word chronometer or chronology. Before that, he was known as Saturn. And before that, he was known as Set, the murderer of Osiris, the ruffian, if you will. So there's the whole thing right in a nutshell. Now, understand that in magic and in masonry, the adept's word is his power. Osiris' missing member is the lost word. And here's the great mystery of masonry, the great mystery of all these ancient mystery religions. And I'm going to try and be as delicate as I can about this, folks, but it's kind of gross. This is what these people worship. Believe it or not, the mystery that none of these people could solve, that none of these people, these ancient sages could understand is the fact that the male organ, when it brings forth seed, it dies and can't be resurrected for a while, whereas the female organ is immortal or eternal. That is what this whole thing is about. You know, talk about penis envy. I mean, I'm sorry. This whole thing is a giant solar phallic cult, pure and simple. And my question to you again is, have you been baptized into Hiram? Now, if there's any doubt of this, here is the symbol of resurrection in masonry. That's the Washington Monument. And when we were driving here today from, uh, from Indianapolis, we passed several cemeteries. You'll see these on Masonic tombstones all the time because this is what the Masons hope as their resurrection. And if there's any further doubt, let me remind you of this. When, when God created the temple, or rather the tabernacle in the wilderness, and even the temple, he put a veil between the most holy place where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt and the holy place. Masons have a veil over their most holy place, too, over their God. It's called an apron. And that's why they wear that apron over that part of their body, is because that is their God. Now, mind you, 99 out of 100 Masons don't even know this. They're ignorant of it. They've never bothered to read the books, just like most Christians never bothered to really study their Bible. Right. 
It's the same thing. My people, though, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And this is the problem, is that Masons don't know, and they're leading themselves and their families down the road to perdition. How about the York Rite? Well, first of all, we already mentioned the stone which the builders rejected. That's, a, that's taking away the glory from Jesus. Second of all, believe it or not, when you get to seventh degree in New York, right, you learn that the master's word has been found. Are we all happy? Can we do the dance of joy? The master's word has been found. And guess what it is? It's Jabal on. Now, you know what that means? What that means believe it or not, is this is the name of God, Jah, like Hallelujah or Yahweh or Jehovah, okay? Baal is Baal, the god of the Canaanites. An is another name for the god Osiris, who is the, like, kind of the sun god in his underworld capacity. So what you have here is the name of the true and living God mushed together in a kind of trash compactor with Baal and Osiris, two false gods. Now, how, how pleased do you think God is with that? Can you think about it? Not only that, you know what else? They use God's name as a password in the Royal Arch degree. When you do the beginning degree work, and I was actually a master of the veil in the Royal Arch, they say, are you a Royal Arch Mason? And you know what your answer is? I am that I am. That's the name of God, that he thundered down from Mount Sinai to Moses. I am that I am. So I would tremble to say this name the way they say it. Then we have the commandery, the Christian degree. This is supposedly the Christian degree of masonry, the Knight Templar commandery. Well, first of all, it's based on the Knights Templar organization, which I document in my book is anything but a Christian organization. Jacques de Molay was the last Grand Master, and he was burned at the stake for being a pedophile and a child abuser and a black magician and an idolater. He worshipped a god named Baphomet, which looked like a goat. Now, it teaches salvation by works, but most importantly, and this is the most awful thing that I know of in Masonry, and it's pretty bad, folks. You, you, when you take the oath as a Knight Templar, I did this myself. You're led into a room, it's all in black, and there's this huge triangular altar with a black velvet tablecloth with 13 burning candles. This is supposed to be the Last Supper, okay? There's a huge Bible open with a skull on it. You go through the oath, and then you're, you take this skull in your hand, the top is removed, and you discover there's wine in it. And the oath, the penalty of the oath, like, you know, having your throat cut and all of that, you take communion out of this skull and you swear in the name of Jesus, because this is the Christian degree, remember, you swear in the name of Jesus that if you ever reveal the secrets of this degree, that all the sins that you ever committed will come back on your head and that all the sins of the man who, from whose skull you are drinking will come back on your head. Now, talk about crucifying the Son of God afresh and bringing him to an open shame. Jesus Christ died for your sins if you're a Christian. He washed them away with his shed blood. You're saying you want them back if you ever break this oath. I mean, first of all, you shouldn't be taking the oath in the first place. But beyond that, that is appalling. That is blasphemy of the first water. Now, how about the Scottish Rite? Well, in the 19th degree, and I sat through this, I know it's true, they call up the devil. They have a whole ritual where they call up the devil. He comes out and he terrorizes all these Christian ministers and makes fools out of them. And then you're anointed in that same degree a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now think about that. That's Jesus' priesthood. And the Masons certainly don't have the right to convey it. Now guess what the sacred, secret word of the 17th degree, the Knights of the East and West is. It's Abaddon. Abaddon is another name for the devil, the angel of the bottomless pit. And then there's more communion out of a human skull. These guys are really into this skull thing, let me tell you. Then we have the mystic shrine. Whoops. 
The mystic shrine, first of all, it's, very, it's all Islamic. You swear on the Quran, you swear in the name of Allah, the God of, the, of my forefathers, the God of the Muslim and the Muhammadan. That's how the oath is sworn. And I'm sorry, Allah is not my God and he's not the God of my forefathers, one way or the other. And in addition to that, there's a whole bunch of ungodly tomfoolery that I don't have time to even get into. Then the next thing we'll look at briefly is the Eastern Star. What's wrong with the, everybody says, oh, what's wrong with the Eastern Star? It's so special. We get to, we sing the old rugged cross. We sing, I walked in the garden alone. When the, you know, nah, nah, nah. And I mean, it's like, yeah, it's all real sweet. But guess what? Rat poison is 95% good food, too. But it's the 5% poison that kills the rat. Squeak, squeak, squeak. <laughs> all right. This is the signet of the Order of the Eastern Star. This is the official seal of the Church of Satan. Gee, uh, does that look similar somehow? Or is that just a coincidence, maybe? Now, you could say, yeah, that's a coincidence, except, first of all, this is Baphomet here in the center. Remember the god that the Knights Templar worshipped, that the Masons were thrilled with? Not only that, but look at something else. I'm going to take this away for a minute. Believe it or not, you notice these colors? Well, these colors are perfect according to black magic. They go with the correspondences of the black magic pentagram that, for example, you will see in the Order of the Golden Dawn in the color plate there. This is, this is earth, air, fire, and water. Now, this fifth point, which is white, is the acacia. And that's like the astral stuff of ectoplasm and the dream realm and all of that. Um, additionally, as if that ain't bad enough, Guess what, folks? The Eastern Star is not the Star of Bethlehem. They say, oh, but our motto, we've seen this star in the East and are come to worship him. Well, here's the problem. The, ma the Magi were not looking East to see a star. They were already in the East seeing the star, which was West. Think about it. If they were, say, in Persia or India, and they were looking at Bethlehem, they would be looking what direction? West. The star was in the west. It was the western star, not the eastern star. You know what the eastern star actually means? It is a Masonic and occultic code word for the star Sirius, the dog star, which is the most cursed star in the Egyptian sky. It is the star of Set. It's the star of Satan. And it, right now, we're in its time frame. We're in what is called, you know why this period is called the dog days? Because in the Egyptian latitudes, this is when the dog star Sirius was at its highest point. And it was the hottest, it was the most blasted, cursed time of year because the Nile was at its lowest point and all the crops were dying and everything. And this is the star that they're praying around in the order of the Eastern Star. Additionally, the five star points were ruled over by pagan goddesses, not by biblical characters. Okay, I'm, I need to speed along here. How do you witness to one of these fellas? Let's say you've got a mason. Well, my best advice to you is to keep it simple. Just keep it simple. Don't try and unload on him everything that I've told you tonight. Because for one thing, you won't remember it. For another thing, it'll just blow them away. So don't bother to do all of that. Just, just talk about the fact that it's a religion. Show them that it's not Christianity, which I've demonstrated very readily. Talk about the oaths. That's a very good one to lean on. And if you're interested in doing this seriously, we have a tract available from our ministry called Secret Sins. It's 25 cents. And we'll be happy to send it to you along with some other information free if you contact us. Uh, and it will tell you how to witness to a Mason. It's designed to even be given to a Mason. And my question to the Mason is, how many things need to be wrong with an organization before they leave it? Very important question. Now, if you're a Mason, how do you get out? Well, with apologies to AA, here are my suggestions as we close. Step one, realize that masonry is sin and making your spiritual life unmanageable. Two, turn the issue of masonry in your life over to God. Three, ask the Lord Jesus Christ to give you the power to break away from the bondage of the craft. Step four, get on your knees and ask Jesus to forgive you for your involvement in the lodge. Step five, in prayer, renounce the lodge and the oaths you made in Jesus' name. Step six, 
Ask Jesus to cut any ungodly ties, like the cable told him, may exist. Step seven. In Jesus' name, renounce the false headship of the Grand Lodge. Eight, in Jesus' name, renounce the strong men of masonry and command them to leave you and your family, never to return. You may ask, what are the strong men? Well, I'm being a nice guy. I'm telling you what they are. Those are the demon forces that are behind the lodge. Tubal Cain, Baphomet, Jabulon, Hiram Abiff, and Dagon. Step nine, send a letter of Demit asking to get out of the lodge. Step 10, destroy all Masonic trinkets, books, aprons, preferably by fire. Step 11, seek through prayer, Bible study, and meditation to strengthen your conscious contact with God and invigorate your sensitivity to the promptings of His Spirit. And step 12, having had this spiritual awakening, tell as many Masons as possible about the Lodge and lead those who are lost to Jesus Christ. And if you're a Mason and you're here tonight, you need to do those things. You need to renounce it. You need to repent of it, and you need to ask Jesus Christ to break the power of the curses that you have laid on your family, which are very real, over them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, brother. And we're going to be doing that in just a moment. Let me just say that there's two groups of people probably watching this video. The first one is the Christian that unknowingly got into this Masonic influences. And there's several different, obviously, uh, chapters that you can get into. The second one that might be watching it is the person that is just now coming to Christianity. And we're going to cover both of those. First of all, if you have named the name of Jesus, if you've asked to be a Christian once, and you're now into Masonry, obviously you have picked up some baggage you need to drop. You've got some spots on you that you need to have washed off. And we're going to talk about how to get those washed off and how to get rid of this Masonic influence in your life. And if you have never been a Christian and you've been into Masonic uh, influences, then how do you get those washed off? And the good news is the blood of Jesus still has power to wash away sins. Okay, how do we get those sins washed away? The first thing we have to realize is that we're all sinners. Uh, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have, every one of us. Before we were born, we were sinners. The next thing we have to realize is we cannot ever do enough good or be good enough or put in the plate enough or to help the church enough or to help the Masonic Lodge enough. We can never earn our way into heaven. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For it is by grace you are saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, then how do we reach out and take this gift of salvation? How do we reach out and grab the uh, detergent off of the shelf that washes all of the sins of all of this masonry off of our heart? How do we get all cleaned up? How do we get the mud washed off of us? It's very simple. Two scriptures. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's that simple. All we have to do is say it and believe it. It's not enough to just say it, and it's not enough to just believe it. Okay, we've got to say it and we've got to believe it. It's, it's that simple. If you've been a Mason, you've been dabbling in this, and I know many of you have or will be watching on the video have, or even if you've never been a Christian and you've still been a Masonry, the detergent works the same. It's the blood of Jesus. What he did on that cross, it's as simple as that. You see, in the days of Noah, they used to bring an innocent little lamb and lay it on the altar. And no one would call his children and have them lay their hands on that innocent little lamb and confess their sins. And then they had to kill that lamb, and that lamb stood in the place, of, took the punishment that they took. Well, then God sent his perfect lamb, the name of Jesus, and he hung on the cross. And by us simply saying, I ask him to take my place, I ask him to take my sins away, for him to stand in the place of that little lamb, then all of our sins are washed away. And our name is written in the book of life. 
It's not over there. That's only a start. That's just the first step. Because Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, for the washing away of your sins, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the, uh, uh, of the Holy Ghost. Now, what is repent, though? It means I'm not going to go and get out of this and then turn around like the dog to his vomit and go right back and step in the mud again. It means I'm going to make a commitment that from here on out, no more sin, no more spot, no more masonry, no more evil. From here on out, I'm making a commitment that I will follow God's laws. Does that mean we're perfect? No, but it means our objective to be perfect is. Our objectives change, all right? That's what he's talking about. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask you to go out and knock on the hearts of those people in the audience and those people watching the video. Those people you want to save and wash their sins away that they would not put it off, but their eyes would be open and that they would make that decision right now in Jesus' name. Now, you may have prayed the prayer we're about to pray before, but you probably stepped in the mud a couple of times since then. And you may never have prayed it before, but I'm going to ask everyone to pray it together with me. I pray it every day. Every day I ask my sins to be washed away again. So let's all say it together. Everyone bowed head, no one looking around. Dear Heavenly Father, I admit I'm a sinner. And I confess with my mouth. And I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God died on the cross, arose three days later, asked Him to wash my sins away, write my name in the book of life, keep me holy, and save me in the day of trouble, and forgive any sins of masonry in Jesus' name. Now, that's only a first step. It's not over. That's only the first step. A lot of people will try to tell you, well, all you got to do is pray that little prayer, and now you're saved, and you can go on and live like the devil. But that's not what the Bible says. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord. Just because you prayed that little prayer does not mean you get in. It's a first step. Not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those that doeth the will of the Father. We've got to follow on. He says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Okay? It's not over in another way. Matthew 10, 32 and 3 says, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before the Father which is in heaven. Whosoever denies me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. In other words, he wants you, just like here, they make, you make confessions and oaths to get into it. One confession God wants you to make is before your fellow friends, before your boss, before your co-workers, before other people, confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. But if you just prayed that, very first, uh, that prayer for the very first time, would you raise your hand, please? Thank you.